Well, welcome to Graceway Baptist Church and our Sunday School Hour. And uh, this is the one we're going to present on March 24th of 2024. And uh, that's, a, that's one of those dates that kind of gets my heart. My mother passed away on uh, March 24th of 2001. Those of you who have been in the church since I have, can you believe it's been that long? She's been in heaven that long. And uh, so this date always kind of gets my attention and uh, no exception here today. But as we look at our Sunday school lesson, we're going to talk about hospitality, fellowship, and hope. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. Now Abraham is getting closer and closer to the birth of Isaac, that, that preposterous, biologically impossible situation, all of the humiliation, all of the shame, all of the embarrassment he has had to bear from people who think this is just crazy and that Abraham's probably kind of gone around the bend, if you know what I mean on that. Uh, he's finally lost it. Dementia has set in uh, and yet the time is coming. I mean, he's going to be proved uh, right and um, he's going to be proved faithful and God is going to vindicate him. And more than anything else, God is going to show himself to be fa faithful in these impossible situations. So uh, the time is near. <clears throat> and after all of the affirmations, think about how many times God has appeared and promised, all the years of waiting, the Lord makes a birth announcement and Isaac will be born within the year in spite of all of the obstacles because nothing is too hard for God. Boy, I wish we could understand that. And that is similar to what Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Nothing's impossible with God. I wish we really believed that. We say that and we think that. I wish we really believed it and lived like it. And uh, Abraham's going to have a visit that is unexpected, unannounced, but it's one that they would never, ever forget. Okay? We find in our text here, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, just trying to remain cool in some way, probably in the shade. Verse 2, So he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them on this hot day, he ran, this old man ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Again, he's an old man doing that. That's pretty amazing. And he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried back to the tent, into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. That's the good stuff and knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took uh, butter and milk and the calf which he had uh, prepared and set it before men, these, these guests, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, he's not just watching them eat. I mean, obviously, he would be noticing whether they enjoyed it or not. Any good host would. But he's ready there to get anything that they need. He's ready there to serve them. He's ready there to converse with them and uh, uh, make sure that they are having a good time. He, he's a good host. So he stood by them under the trees as they ate. And then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? No mention of how they knew her name or knew that she was even around. And he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, the gestation period. 
and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Okay, this is, again, one of those things to where how many times does God have to say it for it to be true? And the answer, of course, is one time. And yet God has been so kind as to say this and to reiterate this promise to Abraham over and over and over again. And so this is something that we find that is extremely gracious and kind of God. And uh, now we find that uh, as this happens, these three visitors come and one of them uh, seems to be a little different than everyone else. Now we find out that these are angels that are coming to him. But as you know, we've seen as we've gone through the Old Testament, there are times when there's this one angel that is designated as the angel of the Lord. And if you'll notice in the text when you read about this, when this one particular angel speaks, when it uses the pronoun he, it's a capital H because we believe that this is the Lord Jesus himself. And he's going to make some proclamations, some prophecies and things like that that are going to be the kind of thing that only God would make. So we uh, say that this was the Lord Jesus meeting with him and giving him this particular word. So number one, this was a divine encounter. And that's why the Lord appeared to him, it says, by the terebinth trees. Well, it says three angels, but right here in verse 1 it says it's the Lord. And that's what we mean. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. They seem to come out of nowhere because Abram's just sitting in the door of the tent. Maybe there's a little breeze there. Maybe there's some shade there. Maybe he's got a jug of water beside him and uh, you know he can get that. Maybe there's some snacks or something like that. We don't know. But he lifts up his eyes and all of a sudden he sees these men. Now when you're out there in the middle of the desert, there's not any real vegetation for uh, anything to block your view. Um, so you would think he would have seen them coming a long, long, long way off. But according to this, they were within running distance. Running distance of a 100-year-old man. I'm going to say that's not terribly far. But he sees them. And he runs out to them and then he greets them. And he asks them to stay there and uh, not pass on by. And uh, so there he is. He greets the three men. Now verse 1 gives us a summary of what's going to happen. And then it tells us how it's happened. Just like we said in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Summary statement. And then he goes into detail of telling us how it happened. That was Moses writing style and that's what happened here as Moses writes this down for us. And so it was an ordinary and normal situation on the surface and it's unclear whether Abraham initially recognized the significance of this visit or probably did not realize it was the Lord right at the first. He just thinks it's three visitors. And he wonders, maybe as he rubs his eyes, why didn't I see them coming sooner? Where did they come from? And maybe, to be fair, maybe there was a hill there that would have blocked his view. Or maybe he was at an oasis that would have blocked his views. It does mention trees being there. We just don't know. But uh, they seem to come out of nowhere. And uh, he's able to run to them and to engage with them in conversation. Point number two. This describes hospitality at its best. This is hospitality at its best. Now, what do we mean by that? It says, when he saw them, he ran from his tent door to meet them, and then he bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now find, found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant, and please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And uh, I will bring a morsel of bread. Notice how he kind of understates this. I'll, I'll go get a little water, enough for you to wash your feet. And then while you rest under the tree, I'll, I'll see if I can, you know, find a morsel of bread or something like that that you might eat. And after that, you can 
pass by after you've been refreshed. Maybe that's where the word refreshment comes from because Abram's acting like just a little water, just a little morsel of all of this. And, um, you know, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. And so what does he do? He hurries to the tent. Sarah, you got to hurry and you got to make ready the best bread and you've got to put three measures of it. We've got to have enough of this to feed these guys and knead it and make not just bread, but cakes. I mean, this is, this is telling you it's a little bit upscale from what the normal situation might be. Then he runs to the herd and he takes a tender and good calf and he gave it to a young man and he says, okay, we need a barbecue quick. Well, you can't do a quick barbecue, can you? In other words, to get the bread, to get it ready, to bake it, and all of the things you have to do, letting it rise, baking it, uh, to get the calf ready and to get it, whatever they did, roasted or barbecued or whatever, it's going to take some time. And so Abraham, when he says, you know, let me get a little bit of water, well, he's doing a whole lot more than that, isn't he? Let me get just a morsel of food. Well, he's making a feast for these guys, and uh, he's going to host them, and they're going to share this all together. This is a big, big deal. Abraham's not giving them, hey, we got some leftovers we can throw in the microwave. It'll be good enough for you. We don't know you anyway. You're just passing by. He's giving them the very best that he has. Now, again, I don't know how aware he was of who these people are. Uh, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But nonetheless, he's giving the very best. Now, I want you to look at the bullet points. Abraham was enthusiastic. He ran to them and he bowed on the ground and begged them to stay. This was not a reluctant, oh great, look who showed up right about mealtime or something like that. Or why didn't they wait till mealtime? I don't know what the situation was. But notice he is humbled and honored at their coming. They're not a pain in the neck. They're not a problem or anything like that. He honors them. That's what hospitality is. We're bringing you to our house under our roof to eat our food, and we are honored to do this. That's the way it ought to be. And he understated what he would provide. You know, they tell you that uh, what you really ought to do in business is um, under-promise and over-perform. Under-promise and over-perform. Because it's terrible when people promise something that they can't give, right? Well, Abram didn't do that. Abraham told them, I'm going to bring a little water, you know, enough to wash your feet. And I'm going to bring a morsel of food so that you can, you know, just have a snack, refresh yourself, and then you can pass on your way. Well, he really outdid himself. And so, of course, did uh, Sarah. So here he is being thoughtful, and he served them the best, not the easiest. Now, underline that. Best, not easiest. We live in a culture where we don't want to be put out. We don't want it to cost much. We don't want it to take much time. And then we wonder why we are lonely. We wonder why we don't build good relationships. It takes effort to do this kind of thing. And um, he honored them by the way that he served them. They were not an imposition to him at all. Number three, sharing food is a sign of fellowship. And he stood by them under the tree. And uh, we think about in the Old Testament how many times, and well, he sat them by the tree, I turned too soon, under the tree as they ate. There he is ready to serve, ready to get them more, ready to bring seconds, ready to fill their glasses if they uh, use that. But we're reminded in the Bible how important sharing meals really is. Gideon, for example, prepared a meal in Judges chapter 6. Remember the angel coming to Gideon and Gideon, Gideon is hiding from the Midianites and he's threshing his wheat in hiding in a wine press, which is not where you do it. It's not the most efficient way to thresh the wheat. You usually do it out in the open and on a hill if you can. And he, an angel comes to Gideon and he calls him, <laughs> this is kind of funny, a mighty man of valor. You know, who's hiding from the Midianites? And uh, Gideon just has a hard time, like Abraham, believing what he is hearing and what he is seeing and what the angel is telling him. And then one of the things that happens is that uh, Gideon 
uh, serves a meal, makes up a meal. In Luke's gospel in particular, you'll find as you read through that, Jesus was either going to a, a party, a meal, or he was at a meal, or he had just left a meal or a party. And that's why he got so much criticism for that. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Yeah, this guy's just a party animal. How can you say that he is the Messiah? And have you seen the people that he is eating with? Man, they are the scum of the earth. How could you convince me that he's the Messiah when he hangs around with <clears throat> those kind of people? You know anybody like that? You ever heard anybody like that? That's a shameful thing, isn't it? And yet Jesus came not to call the righteous to repentance, but to call sinners, and I praise him for that. And so the setting for the Lord's Supper even was the Passover meal. And Jesus said to his disciples, I have greatly desired to have this meal with you. And that's the way it is that we ought to be. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that the early church, they continued steadfastly, and we would expect the first one in the apostles' doctrine. Yeah, they got together, they fellowshiped, they taught, they preached, they recited, they learned, they went over that, and they made sure that they had it. And then it goes on to say, in the apostles' uh, doctrine, and uh, it talks about fellowship, and it talks about breaking of bread, and it talks about prayer. Now, we might understand the early church continuing in the apostles' doctrine, and we might understand that they would do it in prayer. But what's this stuff about breaking bread? Probably means the Lord's Supper, communion. And then it also says they did it in fellowship. And in Bible times, the idea of fellowship almost always took place around a meal. And so in this, they were able to feed hungry and poor church members. They were able to share things together. And they were able to be reminded that God had shared with them the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And so there's always this imagery about eating and about a meal. And for years, Baptists have taken a lot of grief because, uh, you know, there's a story of the uh, children who were told to bring a symbol of their faith to the school for show and tell. And so the Catholic boy brings rosary beads and... Um, Let's see, there's somebody else that brings a cross or something like that. And then there's a little Baptist boy that brings a casserole dish. And we all say, ha, 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 isn't that something? Those Baptists are always eating or anything. Well, I think back in the days when we did that a lot and were known for that, those were the days when the Southern Baptist Convention was growing the most because there's something about eating with people that takes the awkwardness out of a situation. It makes you understand some things you have in common. It's usually, unless the food is bad, it's usually a pleasant experience and uh, we tend to talk more and we tend to bond more. We tend to ask questions. It tends to be that we are more relatable when we share a meal together. And so all throughout the Bible, this seems to be the motif. We eat together. Friends eat together. They fellowship together. They have something in common and uh, what is it? We're providing a meal, we are serving, and we're eating it together for the glory of God. And so in heaven, think about this, when we get there after the rapture, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. So even in heaven, what are we going to do? We're going to feast, we're going to enjoy it, and we're going to eat together with the Lord. And the symbol of renewed fellowship, if you look in Revelation 3.20, whenever the, uh, the Lord is speaking to the church at Laodicea, the lukewarm church, that's where you find the verse that some people mistakenly use for an invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears me and lets me in, I will come in and I will dine with him. We'll fellowship together, uh, we'll eat together, is what he says. And that's actually not to a lost person, that is to a church, believe it or not. A church that didn't have room for Jesus, a, sh a church that shut Jesus out, a church that thought it had enough and it had grown beyond the need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus even says to them, you uh, say, we're rich, increased in goods and have need of nothing. Terrible place for a believer to be, terrible place for a church to be, right? 
And, he, and Jesus says, and you're too dumb to see that you were poor, blind, miserable, and naked, right? And so if you will uh, open the door, I'll have fellowship with you. And notice the fellowship revolves around a meal that we eat together. This is an important symbol in uh, all of the Word of God that I think we have forgotten about. So the next time that the Lord would have a meal with Abraham's family would be at Sinai. And by that time, Abraham, Abraham is long gone and his descendants are numerous and they've been in Egypt for 400 years as slaves. Now Moses has led them out and Abraham's family, the ex-slaves, they're at Sinai in Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. God has a meal ordained for them. So don't discount the power of eating together. Don't discount the power of hospitality. You got some lost friends in your neighborhood that you want to try to build a relationship with and witness to? Invite them over for hamburgers. Invite them over for a meal and share it with them. Take a meal to them if they're going through a, a hard time or grief or something like that. There's something about the sharing of food that bonds us with one another. And so uh, when you get ready for Sunday school on Sunday morning and you go upstairs at the coffee bar and there's more than coffee because Patty Seitz has made so much for us, say thank you. And uh, as you eat that, think about the fellowship that we have through our eating. And when we have church fellowships, don't skip them just because you may not like them or you say, oh, it's just not my thing or I don't trust you know, where all it comes from. No, we're sharing something together and it's more than just getting a full belly. We're bonding together. It's not a substitute for the preaching of the word, but at the same time, it does something that the preaching of the word doesn't always do. It gets us to talking. It gets us to learning about one another. It builds bonds between one another. So that's why uh, we try to do that every once in a while because there's just something special about that. And that's why we take the Lord's Supper uh, every other month. Uh, this time we took it in February. And we're going to be taking it again this month in March because Easter comes on March 31st. And so we will have our Good Friday uh, Passover Lord's Supper on the Friday before Easter. And even that, it's kind of a symbolic thing, but it's symbolic of a meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And it's symbolic of the covenant that we share with Christ. And it also reminds us that when we get to heaven, we are going to have one more good meal as we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. So don't ever take those things for granted. And going out to eat with people after church, even if it's a visitor, Man, that's a wonderful thing to do. Meeting together with people from your Sunday school class, that's a wonderful thing to do because there's a social aspect to all of this that builds us up, encourages us, bonds us together, strengthens us, and it might even give you an opportunity to witness to someone who is lost. Never, ever take that for granted, okay? That's an important theme of the Bible. And number four, notice here that it was a prophetic meal. You know, the Lord's Supper, I'm always impressed that the Apostle Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death. Okay, well, we get that. It's a memorial. We're looking back. But then Paul adds these three words, until he comes, until he comes. Now, Paul didn't actually say, you remember his death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't say that. He said, remember his death. And when we hold that little piece of bread in our hands, we're reminded that Jesus actually became flesh and dwelt among us. But because that bread is unleavened, we're reminded that he is the sinless son of God, the God-man, the unblemished lamb, who was qualified to go to the cross in our place, to take our sin, to take our shame, and to take the wrath of God and bear it in his own body so that we would never be rejected by God, so that we could actually be accepted in the beloved and go to heaven and be with the Lord forever. We think about that when we hold that little piece of bread. When we think about, when we take the cup, we think about the fact that the idea of uh, being saved by the blood of Jesus actually means we're saved by his death, 
The shedding of blood meant the draining of the body of the blood. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy says life is in the blood. And that's the way it was in the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Life was in the blood and when he lost his blood, he lost his life. For without the shedding of blood, without the death of something innocent, there is no remission of sins. And that's why they would offer lambs and bulls and goats as a picture of what the Messiah would do one day. Okay, think about that. I know you already know that. And uh, so why didn't it talk about resurrection? Because the main theme of communion is the death of Christ for our sins. But Paul adds those words, till he comes, because dead people don't come back. Dead people don't return. They have to be alive in order to do that. And one day, and you might ought to just read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about the Lord coming. And uh, one of these days we're going to be caught up together, living and dead with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. What a great thing that is, because the Lord's Supper prophesies about a resurrected reigning Lord who's at the right hand of the Father returning to take us out of here and gather us unto himself so he can sit down and eat with us. Jesus even said that he would no longer take of the fruit of the vine until he does it anew in his Father's kingdom. I think that'll be at the, at the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. This is an amazing thing that he does this and he shows hospitality unto us. And so they say to him, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, here in the tent. And uh, he said, capital H, one of these angels, he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, gestation, and behold, Sarah your wife will have a son. So the focus shifts over to Sarah and the announcement, she will have a boy, a baby boy, in nine months. And it will be the one that has been promised, the one you've been waiting for. And the time for the promised blessing has come. All those years ago when I told you to leave Ur of the Chaldees, all those years ago when I told you I was going to bless you and through you all the families of the earth would be blessed, it's time. Get ready. Get ready to celebrate. This is going to be one more great big a uh, wonderful party that's going to take place and a lot of joy and a lot of laughter and God is going to be vindicated as the one who does everything that he said because it is supernatural. So this story reminds me of Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, you think about that, that's what uh, Abraham did. And that's what we need to do. We need to show kindness to people. We need to help people. We need to share our meals and our food with other people because we never know when we may, as the writer says, entertain an angel. And we, we don't even know it because they look so human and they look so normal. However, the main theme in Genesis here um, is this, is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's what we're really supposed to take away from it. Yeah, we can take some lessons in hospitality, but that's not the real point. And when we were in Israel, we went to a place called Abraham's Tent, and uh, there were some Jewish guys there that ran it as a tourist attraction. That's where Sammy and I got to ride camels and then we would go in under the tent and then they were feeding us and they were feeding us food that they said that uh, Abraham and Sarah would have eaten in their day and fed to other people. And it was uh, kind of funny, especially those of you who know Sammy and me, when we walked into the tent, the main guy there who played Abraham, he uh, would say, hey, how are you? Where are you from? And we said, we're from Oklahoma. And he goes, wow, I was expecting you to be here sooner. Get it? Especially since we're cowboys. And um, it's kind of funny. He did that with all the states. They were very knowledgeable. And then they talked to us 
about the hospitality that we read about in this particular passage and why it is important because in the desert, if you don't find hospitality, you die. And so hospitality was really being a lifesaver to someone else. So when Abraham goes out and runs to them and says, stop, refresh yourself, I'll get you some water and I'll get you some food, that could be a life-saving thing under ordinary situations. And the Bible tells us that we're to be hospitable to others too because we might be entertaining angels unaware. And the requirements to be an elder, hospitality, and other things like that are mentioned in the scripture. We're to share what we have, make friendships and bond with other people, witness to other people, whatever we can through the gift that we have through food. And here in the land of plenty and abundance, we Christians in America ought to be doing it more than we do because we truly have been blessed and have an awful lot to share. But again, that's in there, but it's not the point. The point is, here's God who says, I'm setting up an impossible situation, now watch me do it. And how many times have you had some impossible situations come into your life and you said, Lord, I can't afford to do this, and yet you found out God blessed it? How many times have you said, Lord, there's no way anything like this is going to happen, and then you met a guy? who happened to know a guy that connected you with something and you got that job or you got that uh, promotion or whatever it might be. Think about all the impossible things. How many of you have made it through a surgery you weren't supposed to survive? How many of you are like me? I survived childbirth. No one else in my family did, but I did. I mean, there are lots of impossible things when we think about what could have been and what could have happened. Why are we here? Why are we watching this video? Why are we going to gather for Sunday school? Why do we have the intellect to even understand this and to teach it? Why do we have the spiritual power to present it? And again, because God did the impossible. And let's think about this, Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and He has made us alive together in Him. How do you do that? No one else but God. The devil can't do it. The demons can't do it. The president can't do it. The church can't do it. But Jesus can do the impossible. Keep praying for the lost. Keep witnessing to the lost. Keep serving other people. God can do things that you cannot even imagine. Okay? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. That's exciting to think about, and exciting to think about the fact that all of that is still in operation even now. God keeps His promises. Praise His name. So thank you so much for your time, and may the Lord bless you. And uh, we'll see you again next week.